Newport is a town of many names. In Latin, Novus Burgus, the new borough. In Welsh, Casnaweth Arwisk, New Castle on the Usk. In English, Newport Mon, Newport on Usk, Newport Gwent, Newport South Wales, and even to some wags, Newport on the Mud. With a population of 120,000, Newport is the third largest town in Wales. It's a market town, an industrial town and a port. It has a busy shopping centre and a lively nightlife. As well as the traditional industries based on steel, many new companies have located here in recent years. Its people are down-to-earth, friendly and full of wry humour. One of the most important aspects of Newport's history is its role as a port. Evidence of this maritime history can be seen in many places in the town. For instance, these moors heads in a doorway in York Place. Many Newport men joined the Merchant Navy and sailed all over the world. This fine statue by town sculptor Sebastian Boyson commemorates them. The maritime theme can even be seen in the shape of gravestones, such as this one near the Risca Road entrance to St. Woolos Cemetery, and an inscription such as this from St. Woolos Cathedral, which commemorates a sailor who died, or as the inscription says, weighed anchor, in 1882. Although the town of Newport has its origins in Norman times, there's plenty of evidence that people have been hunting, fishing and farming around these parts for many thousands of years. At Gwena Klepper, to the west of Newport, there are the remains of a chambered tomb. This Neolithic burial place dates back some 5,000 years. The people whose bones were deposited here must have been very important in their day, since it would have taken a great deal of effort to build it, and the stones have been brought here from some distance away. It's probably the resting place of some local chieftain and his family, who were some of Newport's earliest inhabitants. The tomb, in a field beside the M4, overlooks the new LG Electronics factory. In looking from the one to the other, we can see the whole span of Newport's history, starting all those years ago with simple farmers and ending today with high technology manufacturing. Recent archaeology on the Severn estuary has revealed a number of exciting finds, many discovered by a local man, Derek Upton. These fossilized footprints are about 5,000 years old, the oldest ever found in Britain. They've been preserved in the mud of the estuary and were revealed after a storm had removed the surface layers from above them. These are the remains of a trackway, now in Newport Museum, which was used by early people to walk across the waterlogged levels to their huts and is similar to ones found in the Somerset levels. Dominating the town is Tumbalum, this is an ancient encampment dating from the Late Bronze Age, Early Iron Age. Since it only has one ditch, it was probably used for keeping animals, rather than as a defensive fortress. Newport is surrounded by hill forts, such as the one at the Gare, which the local people, the Silures, used to defend themselves against the Roman invaders of the first century AD. The Silures are often described as warlike and fierce, but we should remember that it's Tacitus, the son-in-law of the Roman general Agricola, who described them in this way. When taken to Rome in chains, their leader, Caradoc, who's often known by his Roman name Caractacus, is supposed to have expressed surprise that the Romans, who lived in such magnificence, were interested in conquering simple people like the ancient Britons. Caelia, which today is part of the borough of Newport, was the headquarters of the Second Augustan Legion and there are many remains there today to remind us of the Roman presence. A Victorian industrialist, James Edward Lee, who lived at the Priory in Caelian, founded the Roman Legionary Museum over a hundred years ago. In the 1920s, the Roman amphitheatre was excavated, and in recent years the Roman baths have also been excavated and opened to the public. Caelian today is an important site for the study of Roman history and there's much to see and enjoy in the town. After the Romans left Britain, there were many hostile invasions. 
In this period, the greatest of the British heroes was the war leader Arthur. The Roman amphitheatre at Caerleon was traditionally referred to as King Arthur's Round Table, even in ordnance survey maps of the last century. Gerald of Wales, writing in 1188, tells us that Caerleon once rivaled the magnificence of ancient Rome. Writing in 1136, Geoffrey of Monmouth, in his History of the Kings of Britain, wrote of Caerleon, the city of the legions, as the place that Arthur chose to hold a magnificent gathering of kings. Geoffrey tells us that in Arthur's time, Caerleon had a college of 200 learned men, skilled in astronomy and other arts. Today, Caerleon is once again home to many learned men, as it houses one of the colleges of the University of Wales. In the 19th century, Tennyson wrote his famous poem about King Arthur, the idyls of the king, while staying at the Hanbury Arms in Caerleon. Although no Roman remains have been found in Newport, it seems likely that they would have had a lookout post overlooking the Severn estuary somewhere along the ridge where Stowe Hill lies today, possibly remembered in the name Kyra, meaning camps or fortresses. The view then would have been similar to that from the top of the tower of St. Willos Church today, but of course without the transporter bridge. The period after the Romans left is often referred to as the Dark Ages, but in Wales it's remembered as the Age of the Saints, the most important of which locally were Gwyn Llyw, his wife Gladys and his son Cadog. Caerleon lies in the parish of Llangatoc, the enclosure of Cadog, and Gwynthlyw gave his name to Pilgwenthly and St. Wulos Church, Wulos being the Saxon version of Gwynthlyw. The first settlement in Newport was around St. Wulos Church at the top of Stowe Hill. There's a story that Gwynthlyw had a dream in which he was told to found a church at the place where he found a white bull with a black spot on its head. This story is remembered today by Sebastian Boyson's sculpture situated in the Austin Friars. Newport was originally part of the Marcher Lordship of Glamorgan, ruled by Robert Fitzhamon. Robert of Hay, a vassal of Fitzhamon, probably built the first Norman castle at Newport around the year 1100. This castle was situated on Stowe Hill, near St. Willos Hospital, and would have been built of wood on top of an earthen mound or mott. Nothing remains of this castle today, as it was covered by spoil taken from the railway tunnel in the middle of the last century. St. Wulos Church contains a fine Norman arch and an interesting font that was reconstructed in the last century from fragments of the original. The pillars below the Norman archway are thought to have come from a Roman building, possibly from Caerleon, although there may well have been a Roman building on or near the site of the church. The Norman marcher lords commanded the coastal lands, but left the uplands to the control of Welsh princes. The Morgan family of Tredega claimed descent from the Welsh princes of Gwent, based at Caerleon, whose crest was three Welsh castles. These Welsh castles are not to be confused with the three Norman castles of Grossmont, White Castle and Skenfrith. In 1314, Robert de Clare was killed at Bannockburn fighting the Norman Scots and the Lordship of Newport descended to his sister Margaret, who married Hugh de Audley. After the defeat of rival claimants, the Dispensers, in 1327, de Audley was able to develop the Lordship. On his death in 1347, the Lordship passed to his daughter, who married Ralph, Earl of Stafford. Ralph's son Hugh gave Newport its first charter in 1385, and it's from the Staffords that Newport gets its familiar crest and cherub. It was the Staffords who built the present castle at Newport, with its fine water gate and vaulted ceiling. However, over the next two centuries, the Stafford family themselves enjoyed mixed fortunes. Richard III executed the seventh Earl, and Henry VIII executed the eighth Earl. 
Unfortunately, most of the castle grounds were lost to a road scheme in the 1970s. However, recent work to open up the castle as part of a riverside walk is a considerable improvement, even if it has now become the haunt of alcoholics and bored adolescent would-be mountaineers. On several occasions, Newport became the scene of fighting. In 1173, Henry II deprived Yorworth ap Owain of his possessions and the Welsh attacked the castle of Newport. In 1265, Simon de Montfort briefly took Newport, and the Welsh attacked the castle on several other occasions, most notably as part of the Rising led by Owain Glyndwr in 1403. Under the Charter of 1385, Newport's burgesses were allowed to hold markets and fairs. The head of the market cross was found in the river and is now in the museum. It was situated near Cross House, on the corner of Havelock Street and Stowe Hill. Following Henry VII's victory at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, his supporters, such as Sir John Morgan of Tredegar, were well rewarded. Sir John died in 1493, and the remains of his tomb can be seen today in St. Wolos Cathedral. Outside, on the tower of St. Wolos, is a statue believed by many to be that of Jasper Tudor, the uncle of Henry VII, who owned lands in the area and may have paid for the rebuilding of the church. The original Tudor house at Tredega can be seen behind the modern extension of the 1660s. Leland, who travelled through Wales in about 1540, described Newport as a big town with three gates, a great stone gate by the bridge at the east end of the town, another in the middle in the high street, and the third at the west end of the town. The east gate was beside the castle facing the bridge. The middle gate was at the top of Market Street, which used to be known as Cross Keys Lane, and the west gate was at the top of Skinner Street. It's likely that there was a wall going from the castle around where Cambrian Road now is to the middle gate. Running down Cross Keys Lane was a stream leading into a pill below the bridge. As the town expanded, the wall would have been extended to the west gate, and from there it would have joined up with the town pill, which ran up alongside Skinner Street. Whilst some people doubt the existence of a stone wall, recent building work has revealed some foundations at the site of the old post office and on the corner of Yates's wine bar. Leland went on to say that the fairest of the town is all in one street, and that the town is in ruin. He also remarked that there was a house of religion by the quay beneath the bridge. This was the Augustinian friary founded by Hugh, Earl of Stafford in 1377, known as the Austin Friars. Churchyard, in his Worthiness of Wales, written in 1587, recorded that Newport had a right strong bridge of timber new. In fact, Newport had a wooden bridge until the year 1800. The wooden bridge was replaced by a stone bridge. The stone bridge itself was demolished in 1926. Churchyard tells us that in this market town there was many a merchant's shop, and that many sailed to Bristow from that port. The Tudor port books confirm that there was at this time a healthy sea trade being conducted with Bristol. The boats would have sailed from the quay beneath the town bridge. There would also have been a number of ships sailing from the quay beside the Hanbury Arms in Caerleon to Bristol, and in the 17th century, Caerleon was a more popular destination than Newport, since it was important to get goods as near to their final destination as possible using sea and river transport. Some ships carrying wine, brandy and salt would have sailed here directly from France, but most goods came via Bristol. The trade with Bristol carried on into the 19th century, until the Seven Tunnel was built. The Welsh Prince, seen here, last sailed in 1886. Although few buildings in Newport survive from this period, the pattern of many of the streets is still with us, together with their names High Street, Corn Street, Skinner Street and Mill Street. The layout of the town in 1800 was more or less the same as it had been in Tudor times. 
Until the 1830s, St. Wulos Church lay just outside the town boundary, as described in the Charter of 1385. There was also another friary near St. Wulos Church. Near this site today is the present building called the Friars, which was built by Octavius Morgan, brother of Sir Charles Morgan of Tredegar. Octavius was a great antiquarian and collector. Along with James Edward Lee, he founded the Legionary Museum in Killeen. Octavius's clock collection is now in the British Museum in London. The Friars now houses the headquarters of the local hospital trust. The small extension on the side, which looks like a chapel, was in fact the dairy. The Murringer House in High Street, which is now a very popular public house, is believed to have been the townhouse of the Herberts. A Murringer is the person who in the Middle Ages was paid to maintain the walls of a town. However, it's only recently that this building has been given this name. From an old map of about 1750, it can be seen that the Murringer was also an inn, but that its name then was the Fleur de Lis. After Roger died, his widow Mary continued as landlady until her death in 1720, aged 65. Another branch of the Herbert family lived at St. Julian's house, which was sadly pulled down earlier this century. Many houses in Newport contained dog wheels, like this one in the Hanbury Arms in Killeen. A little dog, the turnspit, would have been placed in the wheel. There was a mechanism going from the wheel to the spit so that the spit holding the meat could be turned by the little dog running around inside the wheel. Iron was already being exported from Newport and Killeen in Tudor times, and in the 17th century William Morgan of Tredegar operated his own forge in Tredegar Park. Towards the end of the 18th century, there was a revolution in the method of production of iron, whereby coke, made from coal, was used instead of charcoal. There were already many charcoal blast furnaces in South Wales, notably those operated by the Hanburys of Pontypool. The new techniques meant that South Wales was well placed to take advantage of its abundant supplies of coal, iron ore and limestone. Many new blast furnaces were established at the heads of the valleys, from Hirwine in the west to Blynavon in the east. The main problem, however, was finding a way of bringing all of this extra production to the coast so that it could be exported. Originally, it had been carried on the backs of mules and pack horses. In some cases, horse-drawn tram roads were built. But the main solution came with the building of canals. In 1796, the canal from Pontymoyle to Newport was opened. Two years later, the branch to Crumlin was completed. It was the canal above all else that transformed Newport from a village of about a thousand inhabitants in 1800 to a bustling town of 20,000 souls by the middle of the century. Eventually the railways replaced the canals as the main form of transport and the canals became a welcome source of leisure activity. In 1800 the canal was extended to Pilgwenthley. The main reason for this was that the Jones family of Clanarth owned the riverbank and Charles Gould Morgan of Tredegar was anxious to develop his own lands in Pilgwenthley. In the latter years of his life, Sir Charles spent most of the time in London, only visiting Tredegar for a few weeks in the summer. Nevertheless, he took a keen interest in his estate and in local affairs. When there was a threat of famine in Newport in 1800 due to a series of bad harvests, Sir Charles provided cheap supplies of wheat to the townspeople of Newport at his own expense. As well as the canal, a whole series of tramways was built, at first for use by horse-drawn drams, but later, around 1830, Samuel Homfrey and Thomas Prothero used steam engines to pull the drams, a method which proved twice as efficient, even though the engines had a habit of running out of water and exploding. The Rumney Railway Bridge at Baysleg carried these steam engines to Newport and is still in use today. At one stage, there was a plan to bring the Rumney Railway along Stowe Hill. Presumably, the idea was to avoid the Golden Mile that ran through Tredegar Park and from which the Morgans made a fortune by raising a toll of a penny for every ton of coal that passed through. Later, Sir Charles Gould Morgan's son, Sir Charles Morgan, formed the Tredegar Wharf Company in partnership with his son-in-law, Samuel Humphrey, and two others, 
Rowley Lascelles, and Thomas Fothergill. In this painting, Sir Charles is seen presenting a bull to King William IV at Windsor. Sir Charles was responsible for many important changes in Newport, not least of which was the building of Commercial Street and Commercial Road. Sir Charles' statue has recently been moved to Bridge Street from Park Square. The Tredega Wharf Company built the new cattle market that's still in use today. The cattle market buildings are interesting because wherever possible they use iron instead of timber or stone. The roof beams and lintels were made of iron cast in the Tredega ironworks. Whilst Newport is well known as an industrial town, it's often forgotten that it's still an important market town, a role that it served since it first received its charter over 600 years ago. Every Wednesday, a livestock market is held where farmers from all over the region bring in their sheep and cattle for auction. The Tredega Wharf Company built roads, built and leased houses, and put in piped water. Before these developments, Pilgwentley, or Pill, consisted of a number of low-lying fields intersected by drainage channels called reens. In winter, these fields became waterlogged, and so in order to build houses, it was necessary to raise the level of the land. Ballast was used from the ships coming in to collect iron and coal, and the level of the land was raised by about four to six feet. James Fluitt Mullock's print of around 1860 shows that after Pill was built, there were large ballast tips on the east bank of the River Usk. The Industrial Revolution in South Wales attracted a vast army of workers. Many of them had left poorly paid agricultural jobs where they were treated almost like serfs for the relative wealth and freedom afforded by the ironworks. However, the work was hard and could be dangerous. Men and children worked side by side, and some of them lost their limbs or their lives in horrific accidents. Accommodation was crowded, there was little in the way of medical care, and the company shops were expensive. In boom years the workers did well, provided they stayed healthy and free from accidents. But when the industry went into recession, there was widespread poverty. It was at that time illegal for workers to combine and demand better pay and conditions. It was against this background that Chartism flourished. At the beginning of the 19th century, only people who owned property were allowed to vote. This meant that although the workers were in a vast majority in the boom towns of South Wales, not one of them had the vote. For this reason, they eagerly adopted the Charter with its demands for political rights. The main demand was for the right of all men over 21 to the vote. They didn't, incidentally, seek the vote for women. John Frost, a Newport shopkeeper who was born in this cottage in Thomas Street, became their spokesman. This early photograph of Thomas Street shows Frost's birthplace, the Royal Oak Inn, on the right-hand side. Frost himself had been jailed for speaking out against the dominance of the gentry families and their agents, in particular Thomas Protherow, the agent of the Morgans of Tredega. Whilst John Frost believed vehemently in the demands of the Chartists, it's doubtful that he saw himself in the role of a military leader and hoped that he could persuade the authorities by his fine oratory. Unfortunately, fine words did not move the government of the day, and the great Chartist petition was rejected. The Newport Chartists used to hold meetings in the Parrot Hotel on the corner of Charles Street and Commercial Street. In August 1839, one of the Chartist leaders, Henry Vincent, a great favourite with the Monmouthshire Chartists, was placed in Monmouth jail. It became clear to many that peaceful means were going to be insufficient. A national uprising was planned for November the 5th to coincide with Guy Fawkes' attempt to blow up Parliament. The South Wales Chartists started to arm themselves with guns and pikes. On the night of the 3rd of November, the Chartists mobilised. Three large columns of men descended on Newport. The weather had been very bad, and after the long walk from the iron communities at the top of the valleys, the men were cold, wet and bedraggled. They eventually marched down Stowe Hill to the Westgate Hotel. In the hotel, Thomas Phillips, the mayor, was waiting with some soldiers. The shutters were drawn, 
so that the troops were hidden. The Chartists demanded their prisoners. Phillips read the riot act. A shot rang out. Phillips was wounded in the arm. The shutters of the west gate were opened and the troops fired on the corridor. Many fled and over 20 were killed. Some of the Chartists were later buried in an unmarked grave in St. Woolos churchyard. Phillips was afterwards treated as a hero and saviour. Frost and the other two leaders were tried in Monmouth and were condemned to be hung, drawn and quartered. However, their sentences were commuted to transportation to Tasmania and they were eventually pardoned in 1854. John Frost, on his return, went to live in Bristol with his son. On one occasion, when he returned to Newport as an old man, he was given a hero's welcome. As the population grew, many chapels and churches were established in the town. In 1836, St. Paul's was opened. It's an unusual church. The entrance onto Commercial Street is fake, and the interior is most unusual. Unfortunately, today, this fascinating building is closed, and if a use cannot be found for it, no doubt will be demolished. At least three of the chapels conducted their services in Welsh, including the Ebenezer, which today is a mosque. Its founder was the brother-in-law of Dick Penderyn, the working-class martyr from Merthyr. St. Mark's Church at Gold Tops was opened in 1874. Newport was, and probably still is, a place where there was much rowdiness and drunkenness, and the various chapels, churches and temperance societies did what they could to curb the excesses of their less holy brethren. One example is this fine water fountain which used to be at the gates of Bellevue Park but was recently moved and restored. By 1850, Newport had undergone a spectacular conversion. Its population had increased almost 20-fold. However, such expansion did not come without its problems. Up until the middle of the century, there was no piped water in the town and the inhabitants relied on the canal and some badly polluted wells for their water supply. Not surprisingly, there were several cholera outbreaks in the town. Thousands of people were crammed into unventilated hovels between Commercial Street and the canal, such as Jones Court and Fothergill Street. Many of these people were Irish, who had fled starvation at home and sought to make their fortunes in the booming towns of South Wales. The first water company opened on Stowe Hill in 1850. Friars Fields named after the old Augustinian Priory, where the bus station is presently situated, was well known as a centre of prostitution and vice. Many a poor sailor seeking comfort in the arms of one of the local beauties woke up in the morning to find his pockets empty and his hard-earned pay gone. Many poor people ended up in the workhouse, which is now part of St. Woolos Hospital. <laughs> The Old Town Dock was opened in 1842. Up until this time, all of the coal and iron had been shipped from wharves along the riverbank. The dock made a big difference to the prosperity of the town. Today, the dock is filled in, but the remnants of the entrance lock can still be clearly seen. It's a shame that the Old Town Dock has not been excavated and, like Penarth Dock, turned into a marina. The dock engineers, Rennie and Logan, also built Victoria Place on Stowe Hill, which happily was saved from demolition in the 1970s. Associated with the Old Town Dock is Dock Street, 
which ran in an almost straight line from the dock to the old green crossing. Lower Dock Street still contains many fine buildings, including this former hotel, which, if it had been in Bristol, would by now have been restored at great expense and turned into a wine bar. The old customs house has been excellently restored by the present owners without any outside financial help. The harbour commissioners were and are still responsible for regulating Newport sea trade. Here we see their old and new premises side by side. The Newport crest can be seen at the top of the windows. It's certain that the commissioners are far less busy today than they were in former times when the river and the docks were full of vessels. The coming of the South Wales Railway in 1850 brought further prosperity to the town. The engineering works were considerable. A tunnel had to be cut under Stowe Hill and a bridge built over the River Usk. Just before the railway was due to open, the bridge caught fire and burnt down. As a result, the opening was delayed by several months. The great railway engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel drove the first train into Newport Station. Another railway line, the Monmouthshire Railway, was built up the Eastern Valley with its terminus in Dock Street in Newport. These iron bollards, which were designed to prevent carriage wheels from hitting the gateposts, are all that remain of the station today. As the town expanded, the east of the river was developed. The expansion started with some large houses and villas. Later on, more modest houses were built and shops and chapels provided physical and spiritual sustenance, such as that given by the minister of Duckpool Road Baptist Chapel. Newport also had several foundries. Perhaps the most renowned of these was that of W.A. Baker, who lived at the bottom of Stowe Hill in Cromwell House. His foundry was behind the present Marks and Spencer, and his showroom was above what is now Burton's next door. Today, we can still see the fine drain pipes that were made in the foundry and the intricate ironwork that adorns the roof. There are many fine examples of Baker's ornamental ironwork to be seen around Newport today, in gates, railings, porches, finials and balconies. Unfortunately, much of it was taken down during the last war as part of the war effort and melted down to make armaments. Another foundry was that of Thomas Spittle. Apparently, old Thomas, who lived at Cambrian House in Maindy, used to have a telescope that he would use to keep an eye on his works on the other side of the river. His name can still be seen on many of Newport's lampposts and drain covers. Newport had a thriving ship repair industry. One of the most successful businesses was that of W.H. Bailey. Bailey built the wonderful Stelvio House, once full of priceless antiques from all over the world, which today, due to neglect and vandalism, is to be demolished. Fortunately, the Bailey family vault, which is situated in St. Wallace Cemetery, still survives. Mrs. Bailey was a great benefactress to the town and, amongst other things, paid for the refurbishment of Victoria Road Church. The name of W.H. Bailey survives today as a business in Newport Docks. Another dry dock was owned by Maudie Carney and Co. This picture shows the great ironmaster Crawshay Bailey opening the Alice Dry Dock in 1871. Newport's greatest treasure today is undoubtedly Tredega House, the magnificent home of the Morgan family. The council, to their very great credit, bought the house in 1974 when it ceased to be used as a school. Since that time, both the house, its outbuildings and gardens have undergone a great deal of restoration and its contents have been put back to something like they would have been in its heyday. William Morgan built the main house at the end of the 17th century. 
The stables, which are almost as grand as the house itself, are now used to house exhibitions. The dining room today contains the famous Tradiga Salt. The windows contain coats of arms of the Morgans and the royal family. The magnificent brown room has some fine carving, including this caricature of King Charles I as a mouse. The gilt room was clearly designed to impress visitors. The portrait over the mantelpiece is William Morgan the Elder, father of the William who rebuilt Tredegar. The staircase leads from the staterooms below to the bedrooms above. Godfrey Morgan, who in his youth took part in the charge of the Light Brigade, was created Viscount Tredegar in 1905. He was a great benefactor to the town, giving land for hospitals, schools, churches and recreation. Godfrey's gifts include the land for the athletic ground, the home of Newport Rugby Club, and the Royal Gwent Hospital. Godfrey gave Bellevue Park to the town in 1891. The park itself was designed by Thomas Mawson, who was also architect of Central Park, New York. This park is an excellent example of a Victorian public garden and is a place of tranquility that's still enjoyed by Newport citizens today. Although the buildings are in poor condition, they're soon to be restored to their original condition thanks to a grant from the National Lottery. Godfrey Morgan and his great-nephew Evan also gave some of Tredegar Park to the town for recreational use. This painting of Godfrey, now hanging in Tredegar House, was painted by Rolf Harris's grandfather. At the beginning of the 20th century, an important steel-making business, Lysarts, established its works on the east bank of the River Usk. As many of the workers lived in Pilgwentley, on the west bank, it was necessary to find some way of getting them across the river. Various schemes were looked at, including a tunnel. But eventually, it was decided to adopt the plan proposed by the French engineer Ferdinand Arnaudin to build a transporter bridge. In 1906, the bridge was opened, and it continues to take cars, cyclists and foot passengers backwards and forwards across the river today. It's difficult to imagine that about 15 years ago, there were plans to sell the bridge to an American, or even to cut it up for scrap. Fortunately, the European Union came to its rescue, and it's been restored at great expense, and will remain for many years to come as the most important feature in Newport's skyline. By far the most important product to pass through Newport in terms of volume was coal. Railway lines like great arteries carried coal in a continuous stream from the pits in the coal fields to the coal hoists on the river bank and docks. Up until the First World War, such was the demand for Welsh coal that it could not be transported quickly enough. New railway lines were built crisscrossing the valleys. Coal hoists were built all along the river banks and new docks were built and then extended to accommodate the increasing number of customers for Welsh steam coal. Very often, ships would be left on the mud as the tide went out. These men were coal trimmers, who made sure that the cargo was evenly distributed in the hold of the ship. Today, the coal wagons have become places to play. And even more surprisingly, some coal is now imported through Newport docks. In 1911, new lock entrances had to be built to take the largest of ocean-going ships. This in fact became the cause of one of Newport's greatest tragedies, 
when the new lock entrance, in the process of construction in 1911, collapsed, killing over 30 men. Eventually the work was completed and the lock entrance is still in use today. Unfortunately, it's just too small to take some of the largest ships in the world, which are built to just fit through the Panama Canal. The docks exported all sorts of cargo all over the world. Today, Newport Docks is still busy. A new terminal has been built to export steel produced at Clan Wern, and a variety of cargoes are imported, including animal feed, timber and bananas. Many of the original cranes have been refurbished at considerable expense. Around the end of the last century, Newport was beginning to reach the height of its development. The streets were paved in stone, if not in gold. Horse-drawn buses and trams were eventually replaced by electric trams. The shops always seem to be full of merchandise. And the workers, such as the painters in the dry dock, at Lovell's Sweet Factory, and the staff of the Tredega Arms always seem to be dressed smartly. Leisure time was taken seriously in Newport. There were regular paddle steamer trips available to places like Western Supermare and Minehead. Others preferred Newport's own Riviera and visited the lighthouse instead. Cycling was a popular pastime and clearly there were prizes to be won at it. 
although others preferred the motorized version. For those who could afford it, there was the motor car, but for many others, the Sharabang outing was the most popular method of utilizing motorized transport. During the course of the century, many old buildings were pulled down and new ones erected in their place. This building, the King's Head, had been rebuilt in 1800. In turn, it was replaced by the present building, now known as the King's Hotel, in 1900. Unfortunately, during the 1960s and 70s, many of Newport's fine old buildings were pulled down and some very boring modern buildings erected in their stead. The Town Hall was pulled down and replaced by a featureless modern building. The Corn Exchange on the corner of Thomas Street and High Street was demolished, but wasn't even replaced at all. Fortunately, the facade of the old post office building next door is to be incorporated into a new building. But the new post office is hardly a thing of beauty. The contrast between old and new certainly favours the old. If one looks carefully, particularly above the level of the shop fronts, there are many interesting architectural details to be seen. The Victorians had the time and the money to pay for detailing, which modern architects seem to dislike and modern accountants are unwilling to pay for. Newport's pedestrianisation is not universally popular, but the modern street scene with its trees and flowers and arcades is a pleasant enough environment for shopping. The town is now positively sprouting with sculptures of all sorts, from the rather endearing pig to the rather dangerous climbing frame known as the wave. One of the most controversial items of all is the collapsing clock in John Frost Square. But although it probably doesn't represent good value for money, and despite the fact that things keep dropping off it, it certainly brings a good deal of pleasure to children of all ages. Whilst looking around the modern town, we would do well to remember the famous words of Newport's poet, W. H. Davis. What is this life if, full of care, we have no time to stand and stare?